Okay, so today we're going to talk about shelter standards. This is um, very, very near and dear to my heart. Um, it's the, what I'm going to talk about is a project from the Association of Shelter Veterinarians um, from the Shelter Standards Task Force. I'm the chair of the task force, and I have to say, of like every piece of work I've ever done, I think this is one of the things that's been the most um, incredibly meaningful to me and was one of the most amazing learning experiences I've ever had in my life. Um, this is the task force right up here. Um, it was 14 shelter veterinarians. The group of us, if you took the number of years of shelter experience that we all had and sort of put it together, it was like hundreds of years of shelter experience. And um, it is a group of really strongly opinionated, really smart people who have thought tons about all of these topics and as you can imagine we all agreed about absolutely everything and we never had a disagreement um, but the truth is what we did is we really learned from each other so much as we were working on this project and what was amazing was that we really did in the end agree on so much and so there's nothing that's in the document um, that we don't all agree on which is pretty amazing and we set a uh, sort of criteria for ourselves very early on that when we were going to talk about standards for animal shelters that we weren't going to talk about what the shelter that we work with does or what another shelter does. We were really going to look at what the needs of animals were in animal shelters and that was going to be the way that we tried to approach it. And interestingly, I think for us, that made it much easier for us to agree um, what animals need. Um, and so we'll come back and talk a little bit more about that. Um, we had veterinarians on the task force from a really broad range of experience um, in animal shelters as well. So we had people who are currently functioning as vice presidents or executive directors of animal shelters. We had people who started out as volunteers in animal shelters, people who are working as veterinarians, people who started out as animal control officers. Um, huge range of um, experience within the field. And so that was also, I think, a, a great boon for us. The scope and intention of the project was to create a document, and you guys can get the document from sheltervet.org. That's the website for the Association of Shelter Veterinarians, and you can download a free copy of it. Um, but the scope and intention of the project was for it really to apply to any shelter, as we talked about last week, a shelter, we throw a pretty broad net when we talk about what a shelter is. Um, it was written by shelter veterinarians and it was meant to be a tool for shelters, for advocacy groups who might be out there trying to advocate for shelter animals. We wanted to help by giving them really productive things and concrete things to advocate for. Um, and we wanted it really to be equally important to all of our target audience. So shelter veterinarians, directors, managers, board members, and again, members of the community who are concerned and interested you know, in the quality of life for shelter animals. We wanted to emphasize the important contributions for shelter medicine. And again, as I, as I told you, shelter medicine has been this kind of rapidly blossoming field and we know so much now that we really wanted to make sure that that information was included in a document like this. When I said that ultimately we didn't have a hard time agreeing on the information that's in the document, it's because of these guys. Um, I don't know, have you guys all had Dr. Cook yet? Third years. Third years, too. Well, he'll make you memorize these, and I love him for that. <laughs> You should memorize them anyway. Um, what we decided is that we would use the five freedoms as the basis for our document and for the, as the basis for understanding animal needs. Um, because we felt that if you look at, at these five freedoms, you could apply this to so many settings. And, and these don't change. The animal's needs, what an animal needs, doesn't really change even when the setting changes. Maybe the way you get them what they need may change. And so this became kind of our litmus test for whether or not we felt 
something needed to be included. And what we would say over and over again, as I said, is, well, that's not what we do in our shelter. We didn't say that. We said, well, can you do that and still meet the five freedoms? And so that was the conversation that was had over and over again. Does anybody know what the five freedoms was written? Any ideas? Recently or a long time ago? Long time ago. Um, almost as long ago as me, uh, it's 1965. Um, it was written for a lot, large animals housed in intensive agriculture settings. And so it's really interesting, I think, to me to see how applicable it remains. And for us, it just felt like such a good fit for trying to describe what animals need. The other thing that we really thought a lot about as we were going into working on this project was human and social understanding about quality of life and how much that understanding has progressed over the years. And sort of where we are now, we feel, is that there's really a growing concern about intensive confinement um, and making sure that humans and animals have an appropriate quality of life. And we see that in you know, these two articles as examples about agricultural animals. And one of the things that I guess we really felt was that this is how, how strongly people are feeling about agricultural animals. How must they feel about animals who are going to become a member of their own family? And so we can, you know, again, we see these things, we see it in agricultural animals, we see it in um, concerns over zoo animals. And so we think it's time to start talking about it as well um, in small animals and especially in shelter animals. The other big driving force for us was an understanding of cruelty statutes and what cruelty statutes can do. Um, cruelty statutes can come in after a harm has been done and try to get some kind of justice in a situation. This is an example of, of a cruelty statute, and Dr. Miller and, and Joe Buckley will talk even more about this, but the language, if you start to read this through, it's very, very difficult language. It's, in many cases, they're very outdated. Um, and so when we try to sort of apply this to a very particular situation, we find a lot of the time that they don't actually help to necessarily ensure good care. We're going to spend a little bit of time on this slide because this is something really, I think, crucial to the understanding of what we're trying to do with the shelter standards. If you look along the top of this, we've got all the five freedoms sort of stretched out along the top. And then as we go down, on um, the left side there, we have a quality of life scale that goes from a high quality of life way down to a life that's not worth living. Um, and what you can see, if we just look at it very quickly early on, that this is really where the cruelty laws apply. Way down in that corner where a life not worth living has already been experienced. So something bad already happened. We've done a lot of looking at, Dr. Petronik and I actually, he started me looking into this, looking at similar kinds of understandings of capacity for care um, in human parental caregiving, um, because they spend a lot of time talking about capacity for care. And there's a lot of really good writing that talks about if you identify weaknesses in capacity for care and come in early with supportive programs that you may actually avoid any harm actually happening. And so that, in many ways, is really what we hope that the shelter standards document can do, that it can help people by really um, explain very clearly what needs to happen in order to meet the needs of animals and come in, you know, here where nothing would ever fall below the borderline quality of care, that that's really the ideal of what we want to offer in terms of protections, right, for children and for animals as well. And so we can see here that as, as the five freedoms are always met, 
we can see that's competent caregiving. And as caregiving capacity or abilities fall, then we end up in a situation where um, we're more likely to see situations of abuse or neglect, or in any case, animals' needs not being met. Is everybody pretty clear about what I'm getting at here? Okay. So how can standards help? They can establish what's required for a decent quality of life. They can dispel notions that morbidity and mortality from disease is a norm in animal shelters, and that's something that we had heard for a very long time, and all of us were done hearing that. <laughs> and connect expectations of sanitation, medical care, mental well-being accept to acceptable sheltering, and dispel any notions that all of those things are kind of frivolous extras. Um, and uh, that those are all things that are part of meeting an animal's needs. So this is just an overview of all of the topics that you'll find in the document. It's a pretty long document, and it's not like a easy sit down and you know realtor for the couch. Um, but it is pretty thrilling to me. <laughs> um, and so these are all the different topics that you'll see. You'll see at the beginning, too, there's this section called how to use this document. And basically what's outlined in the how to use this document section is how we've used language in many ways. So there's a few practices in the document that are identified as an unacceptable practice. There's kind of tiers. And an unacceptable practice is a practice that you need to stop doing as soon as you possibly can. Um, that by doing that, you're not meeting animals' needs and may even be causing harm. A must in the document, so so-and-so must do this, is sort of the opposite of an unacceptable pro uh, practice, but probably with a little bit less fervor behind it. <laughs> so if you're not doing a must, then you're probably not meeting the animal's needs. And the idea was with, if there's something that's a must, it means if you're not doing it, you're not meeting the five freedoms. The majority of the recommendations in the document fall in the category of shoulds. Um, which are things that we highly recommend. Um, there's a few ideal practices, but it was really interesting as we were working on this project, there were really very few of us that ever wanted to call something ideal, because the idea was that if that was ideal, it meant you would only do it in an ideal world, and we didn't want anybody waiting for that ideal world <laughs> to come um, to do those practices. So you guys all saw this little video um, last week, and I just wanted to include it again to sort of bring you into where, where we go with it um, with the shelter standards document. So in this document, we actually have something that says animals should be able to turn freely, stand easily, sit, stretch and extend their limbs, move their head, sit and stand without their ears touching the top of the enclosure, hold their tails erect, and posture comfortably for eating, drinking, urination, and defecation. And so one of the things we really try to do in the document is not to say, you need a cage that is X inches by X inches. We, said, we say you need to use an outcomes-based assessment to look at the cage. And this is what I hope by the end of this class, by the end of vet school for sure, <laughs> you guys will be able to do is to look at something and say, well, I know it's not okay. Why is it not okay? Or I feel like it is okay. Why is it okay? What makes it okay? And so to be able to sort of say, well, these are the things the animal can do there. If the animal can't do those things, then it maybe doesn't meet the five freedoms. Here's another one where we, we give comments on um, primary enclosure layout that you need to consider the effect on cleaning, the elimination, where the elimination area is. That the recommendation in the standards document is that the elimination area should be separated from the eating and resting area. Um, and to also be aware of species or individual animal preferences. Um, here's an example of a layout that allows the animal, my pointer isn't working, that allows the animal to have a resting area here, an eating area here, and a pooping area in the back, if you can see. He's got to be 
back there. So not a, you know, maybe not a perfect kennel in many ways, but in lots of ways, a really good kennel that can meet this animal's needs while he's in the shelter. This is um, from a research study uh, that was actually done by Waltham that showed that if you give cats a two-foot triangulated distance between their eating, resting, and elimination area, <coughs> they actually eat better. And so again, these are the kinds of things that we try to point to in that document. Wanted to just show you that we felt so strongly because we, didn't, we had, couldn't find any research that showed that dogs were better off if they had the choice to eliminate away from their resting and eating area. We actually did a small study, it's actually bigger now, but this, is, this graph is just from our initial run at it, and even we were really surprised to see this data, but is it really so surprising, you know, <laughs> that if you give them the choice not to go to the bathroom where they eat and they rest, they don't do it most of the time. <laughs> Almost all of the time. And so we can make then an assumption and say, well, if we give them the choice, they always do it this way, how does that feel to them then if we don't give them the choice to do what they would naturally do? And we can assume that that probably has some effect on their well-being. Um, speaking of well-being, I just wanted to show these pictures, which are kind of, for me, um, some of my happy shelter pictures. And really point to this. This dog is not anesthetized. He's asleep on a really comfy bed. Um, that kitty up at the top is from Animal Rescue League of Boston. And I love that picture because it really shows his body. Doesn't he just look like how a cat's body wants to be? Um, of course, his body wants to be on the other side of that chain link. <laughs> but if he has to be in, at least he's got enough room um, to hold his body just how he wants to. Um, this picture is kind of just a plug for general enrichment, and Dr. Karsten's going to come and talk a lot more about enrichment, but this picture is from Best Friends out in Utah, and this kitty, somebody decided to put this box up on the wall. Nobody knew at that point that there was going to be a cat who wanted to sit in the box all day long and watch people go by upside down, but if we give the right kinds of enrichment, then he can figure out how to use those sort of enrichment devices. Another issue that, just another example, this is the last kind of example I want to get into, is just with spay neuter, and we talk a lot about spay neuter in the document, there's also a whole other document from the Association of Shelter Veterinarians that highlights and outlines guidelines for spay neuter practices. And the bottom line in thinking about it really should be, I think, for you that if spay-neuter is what you do, and it's all you do, and you do it over and over and over again, should you be better or worse? <laughs> right? You should be better. You should be a specialist in spay-neuter, which that's what you're seeing here. These are several clinics, Humane Alliance, and this is the University of Florida, where they're showing everybody how to do high-volume, high-quality spay-neuter. Um, and I really encourage you guys to um, explore that. Just as another example to try to give you kind of a full range of what gets covered in the document. This is one of our unacceptable practices. Use of carbon monoxide as a method of euthanizing dogs and cats in a shelter is an unacceptable practice. One of the reasons that I included it in this presentation is it's been really exciting to see since the document came out how many states are actually getting rid of carbon monoxide chambers. And there's lots and lots of states now that are carbon monoxide chamber free. Um, and so that's really fantastic and I hope that continues. What I want to spend the rest of the time today doing, and I'm going to try to kind of cram this in to a pretty short period of time, is just to take you through a few examples of how shelters have implemented the recommendations and the guidance for standards of care. Um, and these are presentations that either I put together or another task force member put together um, with the help of the organization that's being represented or vice versa. The organization put it together themselves kind of with our help. So the first one is Austin Humane Society and their open paw hand feeding program. Um, 
what they did is they pulled out of the document the recommendations that they really wanted to focus on, and this is from the document, enrichment should be given the same significance as other components of animal care, such as nutrition and veterinary care, and should not be considered optional. At a minimum, animals must be provided regular social contact, mental stimulation, and physical activity. So how did they do that? Have any of you ever been to Austin Humane Society? It's super fun to go there because you walk in and something is really different. When you walk in, it's really quiet <laughs> and it's really strange. And you walk in at first and like all the dogs put their butts down and they look at you. <laughs> and you're like, what did I do? And they all want food um, because they're waiting for this, this program. Um, or they're working through this program. So this is just quotes from them about um, why they decided that they wanted to do a program like this. And sorry, those are probably hard for you guys to read a little bit. But jumping and barking behavior turns off adopters. The ones that are sitting quietly are the ones they always go for. The easy level dogs were getting taken out for walks over and over, while the upper level, more challenging dogs who may need more attention often got less. We want visitors to connect with the dogs. Dogs only seemed to get anything good when they were outside of their cages. And we wanted a way for volunteers to interact with all the dogs, even for new volunteers with limited training. So that was kind of what went into their thought process. And then again, from the standards, regular positive daily social interactions with humans are essential for both dogs and cats. These interactions are crucial for stress reduction and are a powerful form of enrichment. So that gives you kind of a taste of what the language is like. Training programs for dogs and cats um, also serve as an important source of stimulation and social contact. For dogs, such training has been shown to increase chances for rehoming. And this is my favorite quote from the woman at Austin Humane Society who implemented this program. A bowl of food is a wasted opportunity. Um, you could be training the dog. And after I talked with her and after I had really, I knew all about this program before I had seen it actually at another shelter in Edmonton, Canada. Um, but I actually started hand feeding my own dogs and it was a fantastic uh, time for us. We, it was such a great sort of learning experience for everybody. Um, so to, when we set out to sort of talk about, well, how did they want to start this program? There was really no need to reinvent the wheel. There were lots of hand feeding programs out there for dogs, and they followed a program called Open Paw. Um, but they also put together a lot of documentation for what they were doing so they could inform volunteers in the shelter and they could inform the public for what they were doing. So this is just kind of an example of what their goals were. Why change the feeding program? What will it accomplish? Calm, quiet kennels, decreasing stress levels for dogs and humans alike, dogs that are mentally stimulated and hopefully well prepared for the transition to a home environment, shorter stays due to faster adoptions. One thing that was fascinating to me is that they said that a lot of the people who adopted dogs from them continued the hand feeding when they got home and it was like this great bonding experience for the owner and their new pet. Um, then they, they put together some background so they really defined this program. They really had a lot of great paperwork put together on the program. And my understanding is they're totally happy to share the things they put together. Their goals were, as we talked about, providing man mental stimulation Increased kennel appeal, which I think is really important. It's something I've heard Sue Sternberg talk about a bunch of times that, you know, if you're going through the shelter and looking, oh, what a cute dog, and then he comes running to the front of the kennel and sprays you with water and poo, you're maybe a little bit less, you know, happy about him. Whereas if when you walk by, they sit down on their butts and, like, look up at you appealingly, um, it's probably going to make a big difference. Help dogs form positive associations between visitors and snacks. Um, decrease length of stay due to faster adoptions. Maintain behavioral wellness when dogs stay long term. And prepare dogs for transitioning to a home environment. Can I feed the animals? Yes, you can. And so they had these little bins on every cage with a little sign explaining um, what they were for. The big challenges were um, volunteers who thought the program was mean because the dogs didn't get their regular food um, and uh, 
putting, getting the time um, for, for doing staff training, and then what do we do if somebody has a special diet? How do we sort of strike a happy enough balance that everybody isn't, um, you know, feeling like you're making the dogs frustrated? So um, it took a lot of work on training to get everybody to feel comfortable. The other big one, and I want to make sure I hit on it, is this idea of tradition. That they were changing the way something had always been done. And I see lots of you guys kind of nodding your heads. It's a hard thing to do um, in many shelter settings. We've always done it this way. Now you're not going to do it that way? And, and that can be a, a sort of difficult thing, sometimes more than sort of difficult. The other big one was that they wanted to be very careful about disease spread. Um, and this was something that lots of people in the shelter, you know, immediately kind of sounded the alarm about when they talked about doing this. Um, this is one of my collection of um, pictures from around the world of people telling uh, people not to touch shelter animals, when in fact, in lots of ways, what we really want them to do is touch shelter animals. And so we need to be careful that we put um, here's another one. We need to be careful that we put that kind of concern about disease transmission in perspective to know that really we'll come back around, Dr. Hurley will for sure when she talks about sanitation with you guys to talk about it, but most of the disease transmission that's happening in shelters of course is happening from shelter staff, not from members of the public who are coming there to meet the dogs. The infectious dose delivered by something like that is so much lower. Um, so, in any case, what they're doing is they toss the food, sanitize their hands between any direct contact, and they leave a target bowl on the floor, which always stays clean. So they take some food from there and throw it into the target bowl so they're not actually putting their hands up to each dog as they go through. It's a great program. It's uh, doing phenomenal things for the dogs in the shelter. They're really happy with it. And um, when you go in, it really does feel like a different kind of place than, the, than many shelters that you walk into where you hear lots of barking and the dogs are jumping and frustrated. It gives them something to think about all day long. Uh, what's next for them, they say, is working on uh, more quality time in kennels. So things like reading programs and um, just do nothing in the kennel kind of exercises where uh, when a person comes it isn't always the 4th of July and um, that dogs get the kind of quiet sort of non-stimulatory enrichment. So that's what's up next for them. Any questions about that one? Okay. The next one is the Doggy Wellness Hour at the Orange County Animal Services. And thanks to David Morton and UF Managed Shelter Medicine Program who put this one together. So these are, again, these are just little snippets from the shelter standards um, talking about medical health and physical well-being and the importance of nutrition um, and that animals who guard food or percent prevent access by cage mates must be housed or fed separately. So there, as you can hear, where that language comes in and it talks about Again, the importance of nutrition. Talks also about the importance of monitoring and daily rounds. Rounds must be conducted at least once every 24 hours by a trained individual in order to visually observe and monitor the health and well-being of every animal. Monitoring should include food, water consumption, urination, defecation, attitude, behavior, ambulation, and signs of illness other or, or other problems. So here is Orange County Animal Services. They're a municipal shelter, and they're the only municipal shelter in Orange County, so, and that also includes uh, the, town, the city of Orlando. Um, they take in about 18,000 per year, and about 7,000 of those are dogs. Um, they have up to 200 dogs at the time that this was done. They had about 200 dogs per day in 120 runs. So hopefully you can do the math to recognize that there's probably going to be a lot of random commingling going on to get um, 200 dogs into 120 runs. Two staff feed daily uh, once after 5.30. So ouch. This is a graph showing, this black line shows how many, what their actual holding capacity was. And this shows how many animals were actually in those kennels. So you can see how over capacity they were. One solution is certainly more money, build more kennels, build a bigger shelter, um, 
that wasn't a possibility, so they looked for other solutions. Um, and here's their, uh, one of their emails that came in, just wanted to share some exciting news. Today is the launch of our Doggy, Doggy Wellness Hour. Take a look at the brochure we've posted on our website, which outlines it in brief for people to see. This is a way we hope to be able to accommodate our daily rounds as well as monitor our, all of our dogs during feeding time. We have a consistent feeding time every day now, so we will let you know how it works out. You can see their brochures, and there's some great videos too if you look online and Google Doggy Wellness Hour, um, and they're, they're really fun. Um, so here's what they put together, and you can see the kennels will be closed for Doggy Wellness Hour from 2 to 3 p.m. They actually did a little uh, tracking to see when there was a time when they had very little foot traffic and they closed during that time. One thing I love is that they made a huge point of telling people when the dog kennels were closed that the cat, uh, the cat areas were still open so you could go look at the cats if you wanted to. Um, they did a really nice job with descriptive materials and signage and basically what they did is they closed down the kennels, they pulled all the staff into the kennels, um, they put on music and they feed the dogs and while they fed the dogs they would monitor what was happening. Um, so again, I love this feel free to cuddle with our cats during this time. This is probably hard for you guys to see from so far away, but basically I wanted, what I wanted you to see is that they really structured the program. They set out before they started the program to identify goals, um, objectives, the timeline, the schedule, and the staffing procedures. And then what they did is when they got started, they actually kept a journal of all their observations every day for what was going on and um, the journal included things like we don't have a spoon we need a spoon and then the next day we still need a spoon and then by the third day they got a spoon and but you know so by tracking all of those things they could get they could see identify problems fix the problems and then really note how things were going so basically what they did is they turned off the fans turned out the lights put on music, they even did aromatherapy. And then what they did is, when they fed the dogs, they had people going through the kennels, watching everybody get fed. Um, if there were two dogs in a kennel and they were having a problem, they weren't both eating, they would separate them. Um, if a dog wasn't eating, somebody would hang a tag the first time they noticed it. And then if somebody came through again, they would intervene and either take the dog out or try to hand feed or see you know, if the dog needed a physical exam or what it, what it needed. And so they would use that time as this kind of intensive monitoring and doing that while they were eating was a great opportunity for them to see what was going on. So guillotine doors were down to separate dogs if there were two dogs in a run. One dog got one dish. Um, and then the flagging dogs that weren't eating after 15 minutes and then wellness hour ends when all the flags were removed so everybody had eaten or been, uh, problems had been addressed. The results were there were no negative comments that they got from the staff at all, I mean the, from the community at all for being closed for an hour. They found that they had reduced medical problems and cost. Um, they found that it actually speeded flow through, shall we, <laughs> through the shelter because the dogs were doing better and showing better, and they were more aware of what was going on with the dogs because they spent, they had this sort of set aside hour, and for all of those reasons combined, animals seemed to leave the shelter more quickly. So as animals were leaving the shelter more quickly, there were actually fewer animals in the shelter at any given time, and we'll talk a lot about that when we talk about population management. Um, so reduce medical problems, reduce staff stress, Increased opportunity for kindness, and I don't want to brush over that at all. That in my travels, talking and working with shelter staff, and again, I see some of you guys like nodding your heads, that that's why we all got into this in the first place, everybody. And so giving staff the opportunity to just slow down for a few minutes and really care for animals um, makes everybody feel better, and it's great for the animals too. Um, it was great positive publicity for the shelter. Again, if you look, um, it's all over YouTube. They got some really nice publicity, and combined with other efforts, animals were moving faster, and their live release rate actually increased. Any questions about that one? 
Right, okay, I'm not having to go too fast. We have, this is our last one that I wanted to share with you. So the other one is a cat story, and it's from Shimon County, which is in New York, um, up near Ithaca. And these guys put this presentation together uh, with the help of Dr. Brenda Griffin. And the, these are the things they pulled out from the guidelines document. Appropriate housing meets the behavioral needs of the animals and minimizes stress. And so the things they really wanted to think about when they started sort of working on their project was welfare, impact on disease rate, and then the impact on staff, volunteers, and the doctors. And I'm going to show you this little video. So this is their animal intake area. <laughs> that that was really a problem for them. Um, and so this was their adoption area, which was really kind of just a, a bit of a mishmash of different cages that had been donated to them from veterinary clinics. This was another area that was kind of a holding area for them. Um, oh, I, I think actually this was in their adoption area as well. And then they had these other um, housing areas as well. So housing that really clearly isn't meeting the standards of care that we would have liked them to have or that they would have liked them to have. And so again, they pulled out these comments from the guidelines document. Because cats may be profoundly stressed by the presence and sound of dogs barking, they should be physically separated from the sight and sound of dogs. Animals experience a variety of stressors and shelters beginning with the intake process. Care must be taken to minimize stress during this crucial time in order to minimize problems, which may delay or even prevent acclimation or adjustment to the shelter environment and prolong or intensify anxiety and mental suffering. During intake procedures, particular care should be taken not to place cats within spatial, visual, or auditory range of dogs. So they really wanted to change this. So they took out the largest cages from their big hodgepodge and they cleared out a multi-purpose room and, and used these cages instead. And you can see these are a whole different ball of wax really for them. Here they've got a high perch and go back here in the corner where a cat can hide underneath. They can perch on top. They've got separation between where they lay down and where their litter is and where their food is. Um, an enormous improvement. Um, they were able to get hiding boxes for some of the, you know, different, uh, the smaller cages, but again, they weren't using as many of those smaller cages. And this is just an example of, you know, how they changed things around to really enrich things for the animals, that the caging became a whole different um, kind of thing, and what they were doing during this time, which again we'll come back around and talk about when we talk about population management, is that they were fast tracking cats to adoption, so cats were leaving the shelter very quickly, and so they found that they didn't need as many holding cages because animals were coming in and leaving very quickly, so there were fewer in the shelter at any given time. Because of that, this is what they did to their intake area. <laughs> This, so this is the same place where you saw all those cats. This is now the laundry area. Things were changed around pretty dramatically. Again, um, this is a, a guideline that they pulled out. The social and structural environment, as well as opportunities for cognitive and physical activity are important for all species of animals. An appropriate environment includes shelter and a comfortable resting area in which animals are free from fear and distress and have the ability to express normal species typical behavior. This was really important to them. And so here's what they did with the room where you saw all those cages and all those crates all stacked up. This is their new adoption room. Um, and it's just, you know, they, they took um, sort of outdoor dog kennels and chain link and built these community rooms. They also have right here, which I'll show you um, in, a, in another picture in just a second, um, non-community housing for kittens. Um, so there were group housing areas 
for small groups um, for animals who were going to be in the shelter a little bit longer and who were lower risk. And then for kittens, they housed them in these smaller cages. So benefits of group housing include opportunities for positive interaction with other animals, including play, companionship, physical connection, and socialization. <coughs> group housing can be used to provide a more enriched and varied environment. Smaller groups are preferable to allow effective monitoring and reduce risk of conflict, as well as decrease in infectious disease transmission. So what they did here is so much more effective than if they had just turned this into one big group room, right? So much more functional. Options for individual housing must be available for animals when cuddle housing is not appropriate. And so again, they were able to sort of put that in. And one of the reasons I like showing this presentation so much is because I think when people look at the guidelines for standards of care, the one thing that seems really, really hard is changing housing. Because um, it's like changing this big physical thing. But I think it's important to recognize that there's lots of ways of changing things that aren't fancy, aren't huge resource investments, but can make an enormous world of difference for the animals' experience in their housing. So group housing requires careful selection and monitoring of animals by staff or volunteers trained to recognize subtle signs of stress and prevent negative interactions, food guarding, or other resources. Um, and then, this was a big one for them that they, you know, was very important to them. Staff must be trained to recognize body language and other behaviors that indicate animal stress, pain, and suffering, as well as those that indicate stressful adaptation to the shelter environment. When animals are well adjusted and their behavioral needs are satisfied, they display a wide variety of normal behaviors, including a good appetite and activity level, sociability, grooming, appropriate play behavior, and restful sleeping. And so this is just some videos that they took of animals and the way they behave in these new housing units, where this looks really different, right, than the kitties that we saw before, sort of stock still staring off, not sure what to do. This kitty is doing all the kinds of things that we hope that we'll see kitties do. Um, here's another one. Just showing, you know, so here's kittens. They have double-sided cages, so they still can have separation from their food and their water and their resting area. I think this is brilliant, and I not, had not seen other shelters do this, where they've got all their food and water in a litter box, so if they spill it all over, it keeps all their blankets dry. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I see someone thunking their forehead about that one. Um, but what a great idea. Um, and because uh, they've got all this nice soft stuff in there for them to play with. And you know, it's funny because it's such a simple little video clip of kittens just doing normal kitten stuff, right? But if you go through a shelter as, you know, as an evaluative tool for yourself or, you know, for shelters to use in their own shelters, go through and really look and see how often do you see animals, um, cats and kittens in their housing units just doing normal cat and kitten things. Um, and it's really fantastic when we see that in a shelter setting. So again, enrichment should be given the same significance as other components of animal care and should not be considered optional. Animals should receive some type of positive social interaction outside of the activities of feeding and cleaning on a daily basis. And so um, they, like, um, like Orange County, they actually introduced bubble time, <laughs> which the staff totally adore. Um, and so they set aside a time. They love it because they felt like there's no fomites involved. Um, disease transmission is obviously minimal, and the cleanup was minimal as well. And as you can see, um, the kitties really uh, love it. So the kitties and the staff, it was kind of a win-win. Um, this is Dr. Stephanie Genesco, and what she's showing off is that you can go to the dollar store and find all sorts of crazy things. Um, you know, to use as enrichment, especially for cats and kittens, and that is what they did. And here's just, again, you know, some images of what their place looks like now and how everything is things that can be taken off and removed and washed if they need to, wiped down, um, cleaned up, and uh, 
how different this shelter feels now. And again, isn't this guy great at showing off how he wants to lay, not how he's being constrained in his body? Um, and so this, to me, um, is just this enormous change. And what I wanted to do is play this video. This woman, so she's talking to Dr. Griffin about her experience um, at the shelter and what these changes mean to her. Did you say you used to be a volunteer here? I used to be a volunteer here for six years. What do you think um, of the new cat room? I cried the first time I walked in here. Literally tears. It's really different than it was? <laughs> you still better edit this. <laughs> I used to walk in here and be cage upon cage, cages down the middle. The cat litter smell and the dust from the cat litter would just you'd be breathing it in and the cats were so stressed and when I walked in here the cats were just happy they they were relaxed they you know they were they were able to be cats and I think that's my like my all-time favorite statement from somebody really thinking about it that that's really our goal, right? We want cats to be able to just be cats. Um, no matter where they turn up or where they need temporary housing or all of those things, and that we know that if we can't do that, um, bad things happen. Um, and when we can do it, really good things happen. So um, thanks to them for putting that presentation together and Dr. Griffin as well. I um, wanted to thank the ASPCA for helping us support uh, putting together the Shelter Standards document and also, as always, thanking the ASPCA for my partnership. And um, again, to always just kind of keep in mind, this is my son with his brown dog. Um, the day that she got home, and uh, to me, this picture like sums up in so many ways, like why we all do what we do. And you know, last week when I was talking about the payoff, that you know, that's the that's the payoff that we want for everybody. Any questions? So the question is about: um, Is once a day feeding uh, can it be problematic? Um, and do you advise more common, more frequent feeding than that? Um, it's a really hard. It's a hard question, I think, in general. Twice a day feeding for shelter animals is probably a better thing, partly because it just gives them something to look forward. It's an enrichment opportunity. It's a monitoring opportunity. Um, there's some shelters that I work with that actually just do enrichment feeding, so they go through and like do like a doggy wellness hour. Dane County Humane Society actually does this now, where they do just a little tiny bit of wet food at the same time every day. And then people go through and watch who's eating it and who's not. Um, so it gives all sorts of opportunities for that. Um, so yes, in general, um, I think that it also does put more pressure on the one time a day that they do get fed because everybody gets all um, jazzed up about it. But it can be a problem, obviously, staffing uh, to sort of sort out how to do it and when to do it. Um, one of the most interesting questions, and I'm not going to say I have the right answer for this one, but one of the questions that I have seen shelters wrestle with a lot is do you feed the dogs before you clean their kennels or after? Like, so do you make them wait until their kennels are clean to feed them? Um, and ideally, again, a lot of these questions come down to, well, what if they had double-sided kennels? <laughs> so one side of their kennel was clean, then you could feed them on that side of their kennel. You know, so there's lots of different answers to those questions. But yes, I think in general, probably feeding one or once a day is a great idea. I love hand feeding. Like, so I love having them fed throughout the day. Um, if you guys want to see it in action, Dane County fairly recently started doing it. They do it a little bit differently um, than Austin did it, but it, it's, I, I really think it's a great way of having dogs um, engaged all the time and sort of 
you know, people say there's nothing as strong as sort of random re intermittent reinforcement, and it makes dogs really pay attention. And so um, the more there's something for them to think about and engage in, I think the healthier they stay mentally. And I've spent a lot of time talking about it with dogs, but it's true with cats too. Enrichment feeding can be really important for cats, especially sheltered cats probably more than any other species have a huge hard time with eating. You know, not eating cats is a huge issue. Um, or sorry, cats not eating. <laughs> 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 and uh, people use like little treat balls for cats uh, to keep them stimulated, you know, the kind that you kind of kick around and have a kibble fall out of. And so all of those things, food is important, it's important to everybody. Any other questions? So the question is, how do you get everybody to do it, especially when it's a larger population of dogs, and how do you make sure everybody gets fed? Um, I think you're implying in that question too. Yeah. Um, and so we wrote it up. It's in Animal Sheltering Magazine if you want to see their program and how it's written up. Or you can go online and look at the Open Paw program. Um, some shelters do hand feeding and twice daily feeding. And some do hand feeding instead of daily feeding. So there's lots of different ways to do it. But people love doing it, so dogs get fed. Like it's not, if anything I would say the little containers run out more than dogs not getting fed, at least in the programs that I've seen. Yes? I my question is along those lines. How do you, if you have, especially a shelter that has surrenders, pets tend to be overweight already, <laughs> mm -hmm. and if you're having this kind of open-ended free fall, do they measure the amount of food? So they, they do. They okay. put the dogs, in Austin, they put the dog's daily amount of food oh. in their thing. And probably sure, like if it's empty and somebody really wants to feed that dog, they're going to go to the kennel next door and grab some food. And so probably, yeah. I think also that you need to, like everybody needs to keep in mind that shelters aren't perfect places. Um, and while it may not be perfect for their weight maintenance, the benefit, it's always, always about balancing the benefit and the risks from doing particular things. But that is what they do. They actually measure exactly the right amount. And if you put the dog on a you know reduced calorie diet, then you can give them more. You know, that, that works out too. So how is it that they get quiet? The idea is that and the instructions are given there that you're supposed to give them the reward when they're doing something good. So you're supposed to reward them whenever they're sitting. Um, when they were doing this program in Edmonton, they were actually using clicker training with it, and so in conjunction with it, so they would click and treat, but only if the dogs were sitting or quiet. I've seen other shelters use it, and without such careful restriction, to just say, you know what, if you're going by, like, go ahead. And the dogs kind of figure out pretty quickly, and I think that, I mean, I can't give you an exact explanation for why, but if somebody's coming by and they think that means they might get something, they, to me, they tend to sort of wait for that and see. I guess I would hesitate, I would not want a shelter to hesitate to do it because they're afraid, and I've heard this a lot of time, they're afraid people are going to reinforce the wrong behaviors. That doesn't seem to be a huge problem with the program, that, that people tend to sort of get it. And I think just, you know, sure, it's not going to be perfect every time. And there's going to be the dog who is like my old dog that is going to, you know, be so overstimulated by the idea that somebody's putting their hand in there that they're going to jump and jump. And that may be the dog that you need to have staff work with even more to, you know, click and treat for just the bowl, just for sitting. But the idea is to have it be positive reinforcement for good behavior. And they learn quite quickly. Yeah. I just went to Bing County last week. and. I was really impressed with how, how well it works. Like I walked into the runs, and as you go past each run, there are a lot of dogs that were in the back from the second half of their run, and they all come up as soon as they hear that people are walking past. And they're all really polite. They're really calm dogs who sit there and look really cute. <laughs> Great. Because <laughs> so really I was like, I want that one, that one, that one. Um, but I was really impressed, and I, it was like immediate. I, I knew that that was the intention, that it was bringing the dogs forward to interact with people that came to the shelter. And I, I think there was only one dog, a little terrier, that was kind of crazy. 
Great, so she's just saying, I think you guys all heard, but just, uh, she's saying that she was at Dane County and was really impressed with how well it worked and that the dogs were all coming from the back of their cages to the front of the cages and being really polite. The thing that's really interesting about that too is Dane County has a really pretty short average length of stay. And that's the other thing that's really interesting to me is how quickly dogs get this, even in shelters where the dogs are moving through pretty quickly. They like get on the program pretty quick because they realize what's going on and, and it's a, you know, it's a high reward. Okay, so Sarah uh, Boyd, who's a shelter vet in North Carolina, I think, is, I love seeing overweight dogs coming into our shelter, most are underweight. <laughs> 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 and um, Suzanne, who is from the Netherlands, in our shelter dogs are mostly either seriously underweight or overweight. Not a lot of dogs have just a normal weight. And Sarah says, I love that the students are asking questions and thinking about these things, and I love that too.